Greetings all, this is Gerald Clark on February 28th, 2018. It's a Wednesday and it's the last day of the month of February. I'm gonna do something a little different today. Uh, it's gonna be completely unscripted. Um, a gentleman named Ray Kendrick from the Seventh Planet Broadcasting asked me to, well, let me just read what he said. He says, Gerald, please do a piece on the religions who, where, when, and why, thanks. <laughs> so uh, I guess this one's for you, Ray. Um, I haven't done this in a while. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure that I've actually sat down and summarized all of it in, in one fell swoop for a show. So I'm gonna do this off the cuff, to the best of my memory, without having to go pull up some notes so that it's timely for Ray. So with that said, please watch my other shows and my other in-depth interviews on each of these topics that are very sensitive and I'm going to do the best I can to give you some context for each one but I'm going to keep this one relatively short um, given it's already quite late in the evening. Okay so we're going to do the who, where, when, and why. Uh, you know who, do, who did who, who did what to whom kind of thing. So for me um, I kind of generalize some some as an engineer. So in, I'm going to do a little bit that for you today when I get to the why part, okay? So the who, the where, and the when part is pretty straightforward in my consciousness and I'll do it ra rather quickly, okay? And I'll do it by starting from the history and then how the religions in my mind spread. Um, first of all, before we get into delineating um, the who, where, when, and I want to do a little bit of the why first. First of all, you, you need to understand that from an alien standpoint, um, they don't really care what you believe. Uh, it's a control mechanism for uh, keeping people, large numbers of people into I don't know, kind of a, a mind control system. And so they don't care uh, what religion you are. All they care is that when they've made a contract and they're looking for something from mankind, if the majority are in favor of it, I mean, 51% doesn't have to be, you know, 99. I'm talking contractually, if it's 51%, that's good enough for them, according to what I've read. So with that said, Keep that in mind is uh, they don't really care what you believe. Um, so, uh, so, so I'm not picking any particular re uh, religion to pick on. Um, and I don't want anybody to hear me saying that because I've actually experienced a few of them myself firsthand for many, many years. Uh, so I would just come from a place of sharing from my experience. So I guess you could call what I'm doing in the religious community a testimonial. <clears throat> So let's let's start. Um, when I was young, I was raised Southern Baptist. I was exposed to the Bible. I didn't have the scope or the wherewithal, the understanding to put all the pieces together. But I felt that in the big scheme of things, there was a concept of a creator of all. And that's where my investigation started. Um, so I did become very familiar with the Bible. And this, of course, as a Baptist, I think we have the New International Version or I don't, or maybe we had the King James Version, I don't recall. But, uh, um, so I grew up with that, it was baptized, was part of uh, discipleship programs, the whole thing. And you know, in the Midwest, um, the, the religious fervor, I guess, is a little stronger than it was. By the time I reached 17, I moved to San Diego and I went to college and things like that. But I was still, I still had my fundamental beliefs that never really left me. As a matter of fact, uh, by the time I entered the military at age 18 and got out at age 25, <clears throat> um, I had been through more exposure with the Southern Baptist Church and uh, I was very much a part of that community. So, uh, so I had a pretty significant belief system to overcome when I got exposed to new information. So let, let's start there. 
when did I start when I when did I start waking up from the, what I call the religious God spell? Uh, I guess it started when I got into structural integration and started experiencing extreme energy changes in my body as a function of my structure changing that made me question you know what Jesus was talking about uh, the kingdom within <laughs> right well, that's where we're supposed to be focused not on some building or some rituals anyway so that as an electrical engineer I went to college got a degree in electrical engineering after being in the military but that part really always interested me is where this finite meets the infinite so to me that was the ultimate um, expression of spirituality is something that's infinite that came from the source not from something man-made or contrived so I, I never had a lot of confidence in anything man-made just for the record even though I was struggling to go through the belief system trying on all the hats as for you know with the same level of fervor I did engineering and so uh, I, I got into it relatively deeply and uh, so let's go to let's go to the who, where, when, because I just established the why is truly about control. It's not about truth. Uh, and, and and while we're on that, uh, imagine that you had the true concept of what an avatar is, but you withheld that from them so they were afraid of death, and then con then contrived a belief system that essentially had you do certain things so that you earned your salvation. Uh, that's pretty contrived, okay? But that's essentially what took place. So let's look at some of the who, where, and when that I started coming, when it started coming together for me. Um, I clearly understood that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam were considered Abrahamic religions. And I never really understood why. I, I knew the story of Abram. I knew about him being asked to, sacrifice his child that uh you know and then and then suddenly finding a, a goat to replace him and all the controversy that that brings up about who um abram's first son was you know was it was it ishmael that was taken or was it isaac so this brought up some interesting thoughts in my mind anyway while i was while i was thinking about that i'd read all of sitchin stuff i'd read eric von dodek and stuff and it occurred to me when I was reading Genesis Revisited from Zechariah Sitchin to relook at the Bible from the standpoint that now I was an adult, I had a lot more discernment, and I didn't get very far into Genesis before I started stumbling significantly, and I stumbled the same places that these guys did, and one of which was uh, let us in our image and our likeness <clears throat> create mankind. And, you know, the fact that it was a plural form and all of the data in Genesis coincided with some of the Sumer accounts, like the 600 years from Noah and this council decision to create mankind. Obviously, if there's more than one of them there, they would say, let us. <laughs> so all, all, of this, all this started <clears throat> raising questions for me about, uh, especially the Abrahamic religions. So what did I do? So, uh, I actually focused in on who Abram was and looked at him from various authors and also from the Sumer account of who this being was. And uh, there had been a lot of neat stuff written about him that really illuminated who this biblical patriarch is of the three world's made religions. Yeah, there's, there's many, there's thousands of religions on the planet, but the three that get the most press because they have the most members are the Abrahamic religions. <clears throat> and I found that kind of interesting too. Um, so let's go back to Abraham. Abram before he became Abraham. Well, he turns out to be from a, a city in, in southern Iraq that we today would call the city of Ur. Um, and he, uh, he had a father who we know was named Terah who worked for the main god of that ziggurat temple in that city, even though there were multiple um, deities being venerated in Ur, um, one of them was Nanar, who was the moon god, and uh, and also uh, 
there was a half brother, I believe it's half brother of Abram who was named Haran. And then of course he had his, uh, his nephew Lot, I believe. I, I can't remember the exact relationships without going back, but uh, they were familial. Okay. And they were related. Well, uh, so all of a sudden I'm finding about Abram firsthand from the Sumer record in the city of Ur. Um, and he's, uh, his father is serving one of the Sumerian gods that came up in my research into the ancient astronaut theory. I was like, whoa, is this where the Bible crosses over with the ancient astronaut theory? And as I read further, this is when it really struck me that uh, what was told in the Atrahasis was true. When they divided regions, uh, there were two main brothers, and one of them got the Mesopotamian region, and one of them got Africa. Well, the one that got the Mesopotamian region was named Enlil in the Atrahasis account from his father. Okay, this is very specific. So, number one, we had a, a, a written record that indicated that Enlil was in that region. Now, number two, we have a firsthand account from Tara, Abram's father, who lived in that city, who served as the chief priest for Enlil. All right. <laughs> and it goes on and on. So if you dig deep into the Sumer record, you realize each of these cities had functions. And he was the Lord of the command, so he ran the Mission Control Center, which was also at Nippur. So this whole region belonged to him. Anyway, um, so then you come to find out, well, wait a second. If he's the patriarch and the one who supposedly met God that told him to take this promised land of Israel, uh, who was that God? Okay. And then I started thinking about the term God. I was like, wow, what a miss used term because uh there's three over three thousand labels of the term god on this planet in the variety of religions that are represented so all of a sudden i started asking myself well if the anunnaki were called gods by the sumerians in their records um is that where we got that term because the reality is uh <laughs> there's only one creator of all that we know of or that we could imagine. And it certainly isn't a being that's living in a ziggurat temple in the city of Ur with a human uh, set of beings that are real flesh and blood that are serving them, bringing them their meals and doing all the things that they ask them to. Okay, this is not some just ritual they're going through praying to some nefarious entity. They're they're having meals with him. They're talking with him. <laughs> He's, they're getting orders, military orders from him. I'm like, whoa. So let me just summarize that one for you. What I found out is that the names for that being in that area that served in the city of Ur, Mesopotamia, who just so happened to <clears throat> dispatch Abram on a mission to take over a region that we now know includes Israel, uh, you start to wonder, is the Yahweh, Jehovah, God of Israel, the same God, uh, God who was in the Ziggurat temple in the city of Ur? And that's why uh, all the religions that were spawned from that venerate Abram, the patriarch. This is what I found. And you can read the Lamentations of Ur that I included in the Seven Planet Mercury Rising to get a little clarity on the relationship of Enlil, Yahweh, the God of Israel, to the people that he encountered there. And this was truly the God of wrath and vengeance. And when you read, read the Lamentations of the War, or better yet, go to YouTube and listen to the video that Chris and I recorded for Nanar and Ningal, his wife, the king and queen of the city of war, when his father Enlil, by council meeting with Anu, decided to nuke the city, okay? So maybe, maybe there's a good reason why there's a, a large chasm that's been drawn between the followers of Nanar, Allah, and those of Yahweh, okay? And which includes both the, the, the sects of Judaism and Christianity. So let's, let's start with that. But first, understand that the area was occupied by Enlil, who I consider Yahweh, Jehovah. He's the God of the Old Testament. 
Okay, so if you read that and read where um, basically the Sumer account was changed to make Enlil God, you will understand the Old Testament from a whole new perspective. Okay? And this is the, the, the Hebrew Torah, by the way. So this is where the Jewish faith comes in. Uh, it begins with the first five books of Moses, which they call the Torah. And uh, they, these original um, followers of Yahweh uh, are, were of the tribe of Jacob, okay? So truly, I believe the teachings that came from Moses uh, on behalf of Enlil were for the Israeli tribe, uh, the, the uh, tribe of Judaism, that Enlil had chosen to be his most precious slaves, okay, initially. And he would treat them with favor as long as they did everything dastardly he asked them to. And you can see what happened when they didn't. He held grudges. He'd go back after 70 years and just punish somebody just because they were related to the father who did something bad. I mean, that's true wrath and vengeance right there. He was the one who was on uh, Mount Sinai that told the Levites to go kill all their brethren with a sword. And then right after that, inflicted them with a plague, just like he did in the Atrahasis, okay? Over four times, he brought disaster on humanity to try to wipe them out, which resulted in ultimately a flood when we believe it was a natural occurrence, not something he caused, but he took credit for it. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is the being at the head of those, uh, at least two, Judaism and Christianity, both came from those same sources. Uh, and we, I, we all know the story of uh, Christianity coming from uh, Israel and then supposedly uh, ending up with uh, Jesus being killed, you know, on, on behalf of the Romans and the Jews that were occupying and, and both the, the military court and the governance and the religion of that area at the time. Okay, so Judaism was already there, <laughs> right? So, uh, and that means Enlil uh, had significant influence in resisting any religious teachings that were coming into that area. So let me just touch on that real quick, my beliefs on that event. I believe that an offspring of Anki, who was being, who was a completely in uh, opposition to his brother Enlil about how to deal with the avatars that he and his half-sister created, okay, that was Anki and Ninma. You know, it was Isis in Egypt. Well, in the story, um, Enki was demonized because he gave them intelligence that basically didn't make them very good slaves for Enlil. So it was a battle over the evolution of consciousness. And that truly is representational generically of the why they ended up in conflict. Okay, so religion is a great mechanism to exploit some territorial imperatives which are fundamental aspects of the programming of humans to cause them to war against each other do things like that okay so all they have to do is pull your trigger just right to and religion's a good way to group a bunch of people together uh, or a flag underneath a flag an, an identity to cause them to uh, be your agents to because it creates a division of us and them right so this is part of the control so let, let's let's follow up on um, islam Okay, this, this one's a little bit harder. If you go back to the Atrahasis in the, uh, the minor revolt of the Ajiji uh, in Tablet 1, they uh, basically were led by a being named Allah. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> that's how it was stated. So I was like, oh, is that a coincidence? So I played with it a little while and kept it under lids because I didn't want to make any fast... Uh, connections and, and be wrong. Well, this rebel, Allah, that led the uh, miners to surround what? The Eker Fortress, which was manned by who? Enlil. And it turns out that this rebel who led these beings is the same Allah, Nanar, <laughs> that was the king of the second dynasty of Ur that his father nuked and killed all the people there. Okay, and it, it's, it was rumored that Nanar was actually injured in that attack, uh, even though he and his wife Ningal knew it had been destined for destruction in the Lamentations of War. This is the second dynasty of war, by the way. And the kingship moved around Mesopotamia like a merry-go-round 
once Sentinel was in the region. Before that, before uh, um, Enlil um, had his way with the Sumerian kings list, prior to that, the Sumerian kings all served um, full terms, and they were measured as 3,600-year SARs, or SAR. And you can see this on the Sumerian kings list, by the way. And a lot of these characters do show up on the Sumerian king list, okay? including, including King Gilgamesh, uh, who's another whole character in the story. So without getting lost, um, so we've covered the who, where, and when. Well, actually, we know that uh, the, the destruction of the city of Ur and those ones, those are documented in the uh, Sumerian kings list. So we have all of those, okay? So we can, you can go look at those and see kind of the genesis of where Judaism, Christianity, and Islam came to, came to the forefront. But under, I want to emphasize this Allah rebel from the caves of Africa where they were mining gold. Um, I believe that uh, as king of the city of war, uh, when it was destined that it, his city was going to be destroyed, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that he led the minor rebellion in Africa. And this was his father showing him his wrath for that because it was, it was really an unjustified act. It, it, it wasn't even rational I and mean, there was really no human reason why a being would do this so anyway so i think because of that the followers of allah are very much at war with the followers of yahweh and this is by the by design um, if you remember when uh, yahweh told abram that he was going to become, become abraham and that his uh, wife was going to become pregnant at the age of 75 remember this well, he, pro he promised the offspring of his first offspring, Ishmael, he promised the handmaiden Hagar, who was the Egyptian mother of this boy, they pro he promised them that they would become as numerous as the stars, right? So they would become a, a nation. Well, do you think he didn't have in mind to bid that, that offspring of his kids against uh, another one? Because the divide and conquer <laughs> was, was something he did just continuously. So uh, I think this was a pre-anticipated plan by him to set up his son, Allah, for another future conflict. And, that, and I truly don't think Allah, Nanar, Sin, uh, is on the same team with his father. And you see this among the Anunnaki. Even, uh, so let's, get, let's do another one that's really fun. So later in time, um, once Enlil had the Mesopotamian region, Marduk ended up in Babylon, the arch nemesis Marduk. Well, this was the offspring of Enki. And uh, his, he had his own take on religion, if you will, and, and worship. And he was, I don't know, I would say he's like kind of like a megalomaniac. He had, he had a huge, just a huge view of himself, you know? Um, and so we, I don't know that a significant amount about the Babylonian religions. And, you know, they're referred to as pagan and so on and so forth. Um, the more I get into reading about the, the Talmud and the Kabbalah and the derivations from probably that started in Babylon, um, the, you know, Marduk was a complex being and he used a lot of symbology and things, even on uh, when he was decorated, he had all kinds of symbols and geometric figures on him. So, um, and apparently, um, the uh, Lamech, the father of Noah, supposedly, <laughs> right? Lamech and uh, uh, Bilbanos or uh, Atanish. She has a couple of different names. Well, these are the. This is the mother and father of Noah. Well, in the Sumerian story, he actually goes over to Babylon, where Marduk is the chief deity, to learn about building technology right? so um, so Marduk and Enlil uh, absolutely did not get along Marduk actually was portrayed as the Avenger who was there in the Mesopotamian region where he wasn't sanctioned to be who went to war with Enlil and ultimately he did beat Enlil somehow some way and took over the Anunnaki council about 2000 BCE okay so you know the whole history of the city of Babylon and Alexander the Great and all the, you know, the, all the biblical references to Babylon. Well, all through the Bible now that you know that Marduk was the arch nemesis of 
Enlil, look for all the the consistencies in the uh, uh, the times that Enlil Yahweh calls out the Israelites to stay the heck away from Baal. Well, this was Marduk, okay, who was up in Babylon <laughs> and Syria and those areas like that. So about uh, 586 BC, I want to go to a different era for the Jewish part of religion. About 586 BC, uh, um, Babylon's forces, Marduk's forces, uh, sacked Jerusalem and took many of their, most of their skilled personnel hostage. Okay, this is kind of something they would do in that era. And uh, I think this was the first time, maybe the first time, that the um, the Jews that were being held in captive actually got to see the Sumerian cuneiform documents that clearly Marduk prized. He had the Enuma Elish read every spring in Babylon. And because he believed that he was going to be the chief of the Anunnaki council, he built Babylon as a gateway of the gods. That's really what it was, where there were 12 apartment edifices <laughs> for the other members of the council, including him. And they had different gates representing these different uh, family members that had their own different temples in the city. And uh, he actually was there to reestablish, uh, overthrow the, the authority of Enlil relative to what was assigned as what's called the Bond Heaven Earth facilities. These are the space facilities for transporting and communicating with their home planet, okay, which they called Nibiru. Okay, so Marduk was a was a god in that region that uh, was called Baal. So this is another one from the Bible that uh, you can look up. Okay, so, um, and I suggest reading The War of Gods and Men if you want to see all the skirmishes back and forth that have good biblical references from Zechariah Sitchin about Marduk and Yahweh going at it, okay? So, uh, okay, so we did Christianity, we did Judaism, and we did Islam, okay? So, uh, I guess I want to now say where, where was my department? If that was my departure, then where did I go? All right. <clears throat> well, to be honest with you, I took Jesus' advice and I sought for the kingdom within. And that meant for me as an electrical engineer, uh, understanding physics and where energy meant matter, and it be kind of became a hobby of mine. So <clears throat> um, in that hobby, I would say that I didn't throw the idea of a creator of all out under the bus ever. I see intelligence in the design of the universe. And, and, and there's a really good book. Um, what was it called? Uh, it had something to do with genetics. I can't remember. I think it was called Genome. And uh, the guy who wrote it, basically, he ended up at the place where he had to admit by definition that something that has an intelligent design has intent. And he could see that in our genetic code. Uh, so, he, <laughs> and I didn't disagree with that, but I'd always been looking for evidence of uh, intelligence in the universe that existed beyond what we have created and, and not some just falsified interpretation. So I'd always believed there was a creative force, clearly much bigger than mankind, probably bigger than any galaxy or our concept of energy. And so um, I never lost that, but I, but I believe the place where you have an encounter with that energy is in here, okay? It's not in some building, it's not through some ritual, it's not, no. So for me, it was like, okay, so where is it that this energy of the creator of all that clearly is instantiated in all matter, where, how do you be in touch with that? And so the only idea that I had was, well, you have to amplify it or trigger it to come on somehow. And this is when I discovered uh, structural integration. So in structural work, uh, I saw a lot of energetic changes happen with clients over probably over a 10 year period. Some that I didn't understand at the time, but it became a focus po focal point of my investigation into human energy. So um, there was this concept of human energy and some people called it chi in the east, prana, um, the brahma. And, you know, they had all these different names for this human energy, uh, or, uh, organ bioenergy that uh, uh, 
uh, Wilhelm Reich was into. So all these different things. Well, I knew from purely in photography that there was technology that you could see this. So I got some equipment and working with my structure clients, I convinced myself that what I was seeing that was not only an energy body, but it also had a relationship to their structure like they were an antenna. When their antenna was right, the energy was right. When it was broken, the energy showed up maligned, okay? So, uh, so this was a pragmatic investigation in human energy, while at the same time, once I triggered this structural integration process in myself, I was having a profound new experience of energy, which I could not explain. Okay, and I wrote an article on it called Structure as Function as Energy as a graduation paper for my structural integration training in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, you know something had to be pretty good energetically for an electrical engineer to leave a vice president of an uh, engineering <laughs> startup companies and that kind of money to go pursue. What is this human energy thing about? This is really profound, okay? But I discovered this as an athlete uh, through, through a reference by a friend. So anyway, um, so this energy thing was real to me and I was experiencing that, but I didn't know how to put a, a label on it until I started writing about it and realizing that what I was describing was also described in um, the practices of Buddhism and other places where it, it was really about a, a frequency change to experience the energy in full after you cleared your chakras and allowed your nerve ganglia to function correctly in the gravity field. I don't know how to say that easier. But the people who did that were having very profound spiritual experiences, uh, including triggering their pineal gland, which is uh, in the top of your head, that is associated with your highest chakra. And the people that were doing that claim, were claimed by Dr. Rick Straussman to have a, having a blissful, transcendent experience while they were still in their body awake. Okay, so, and I really saw that uh, some of the capabilities of the gurus and the mystics of the East uh, were, were onto something that had been demonized by the West, especially by Christianity. So uh, I didn't buy into that at all. Uh, as far as uh, that goes, let's go back to Babylon just for a minute, okay? So after the Jews were held in Babylon from 586 until about uh, the Crusades, about 1199. They started leaving prior to that. But this is where, after this long exposure to the Babylonian Talmud thing, okay, in Babylon, that they somehow um, glommed onto that. And over time, and, and I actually wanted to bring up this, uh, this one picture. <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, let's go over to here. So over time, you can see that's Kazaria. Okay, this is uh, this is the region where um, some of the Jews that fled the Levant area, when the Christians came to overtake Jerusalem, they fled that area. Okay, so some of them ended up over here, but other ones were probably earlier along the trade route that ran east-west here. But what I want to say is that they were exposed to the Babylonian Talmud. And this was the source of where Marduk, in my opinion, was looking to infiltrate the Judaism that had been introduced under Moses and the Torah. And he wanted them to basically stay loyal to him after their exposure to him in Babylon for so long. And I believe that's where the Babylonian Talmud came into play. And the Zionists adopted that. And now I believe they have conscripted Judaism under the Babylonian Talmud, because that's truly the document that they venerate. So there's a, a, another little connection for you that is really quite surprising. And the reason uh, I know this is kind of crazy, but if you go back to 1895, it's clear to me that Enlil finally got rid of Enki's clan out of the secret societies. <laughs> that's when Thoth was thrown out of the, uh, the, the founding of the Masons, I believe. Because that truly was a mystery school that goes all the way back to Egypt. But it was taken over by Enlil, who became the god of America, until Marduk's uh, incursion through Zionism. Because you can tell this with the prayers, because now they end with uh, a veneration for Marduk, who's the, who's, 
being venerated as the God of America and God we trust. Uh, amen. Well, that's Amon Ra, who is Marduk. So, so I think there's still some serious infighting going on between Marduk and uh, Enlil for the control of the planet. And I believe uh, Marduk is truly positioned right now, based on what I see with his New World Order plans, uh, to be very hard to oppose. And I'm not sure what Enlil has in plan for him, but uh, we might f find out soon when uh, Revel Revel Revelations scripture is coming to fruition and also the building of the third temple is now on the fast track so what you can expect is when that third temple is in place and the blood rituals of killing the red calves is get back in order the sacrifices are resumed in in uh, Jerusalem that uh, Marduk's going to make his appearance there and he's going to claim to be god of the world okay and the king of the world and uh, this this kind of it brings up a really interesting uh, case uh, you know What's Enlil going to do about it? <laughs> uh, so these are the these are the skirmishes you're in for uh, under the Anunnaki control, and uh, we can touch on other religions once we get over to, the, and every country's had an exposure to these Anunnaki gods, like the Viking religion, and uh, clearly in India we've made connections with the Anunnaki between Brahm, uh, Brahma, Vish, Vishnu, and Shiva, so. So they're all, they're all, they, you know, they, uh, they permeate the belief systems. And a lot of times, uh, if the humans are so gullible that you can bid them one against the, you know, each other, uh, starting in Babylon and s separating them by language and then uh, leading to uh, edifices of the other one, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bull with a solar disk on the top, okay? That's for Marduk, by the way. That's what really made Enlil mad in Exodus 32, 20, all the way to 27, was these people uh, being lured into uh, exposure to Amun-Ra again. <laughs> At first it was Baal, and now here he is again. So uh, uh, what, a, what a rivalry. Anyway, so we did the who, what, where, and the when, and the why. I hope that clears up uh, for a lot of you. And uh, from my path as a final testimonial, um, optimizing the energy that I have and my connection to the creator of all, which Thoth gives us clear guidance on how to do in the Emerald Tablets. Uh, that's why I included them in the Seven Planet Mercury Rising. Um, I truly believe uh, he's telling us the truth. Um, I, don't, I don't really see, uh, I see venerating somebody who's part of the light that helps us, but I don't see them as someone standing in the way of my evolution. And that, uh, that is ultimately controlled by my relationship to my creator, which is uh, light. So that being said, I'll let you guys go. And uh, there's a lot to ponder. This has been Gerald Clark with Seven Planet Broadcasting, and I'll talk to you next time.